outro cast. Getting into it, uh, when you were no putting the album together, did you know outright, hey, comic book, or did that come midway through the process of writing it? So the idea was that um, because we were pre-selling the album on Kickstarter, which has become sort of the way we operate these days, um, I wanted a special item that was not the album. Because the reality is that, you know, since we started doing Kickstarters in 2012, uh, you know, me the medium of consuming music has changed so much. When we started this band, it was CDs was the thing. You know, you know I mean, sure. Then, then we started, we were early adopters for vinyl. And so um, we were one of the early bands who actually started pressing vinyl and we were putting it out ourselves because none of the labels wanted to. Right. And so we became like a vinyl sort of whatever, you know, adopter. And uh, then, you know, we went through eras of uh, downloading like Napster stuff where that's where people consume music. And then now we're in this like Spotify streaming kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, I just said, you know what? Not everybody has a vinyl player and some people are just going to put it on Spotify or whatever. And I wanted to have something for them to participate with. And we had never in 22 years of this band done a, uh, an actual, uh, lyric book, printed mm -hmm. lyric book. And I always thought those were cool, but we had had a bunch of artists that we've worked with regularly that are very, um, you know, like good, uh, partners in this sort of murder by death merch endeavors. And so I, you know, I thought, well, a lot of these people during the pandemic needed work mm -hmm. and they were asked like, Hey, do you need any t-shirt designs, whatever? I thought, well, I can just pay them to do an illustrated version of my lyrics. But, you know, I just had each person, 20 artists, each picked a song and then illustrated the uh, lyrics as if it was panels from a comic. Uh, so some of them are like one page. I think the longest is five. Most of them are about three pages. Some of them use all the lyrics. Some of them just interpret. But it's basically just an art project that um, allowed us to present the lyrics for the first time in a uh, interesting way. Right. And then and collectible. And also um, was a way that I could put money in artist pockets during the pandemic. So it was fun. I'm really proud of that. I think it came out pretty great. Um, <laughs> doing it during the supply chain issues was a Herculean feat. Uh, I can imagine, yeah. But, like, you know, what can you do? Yeah, the rare case, the, a, a saying that gets said a lot in my household is no good deed goes unpunished. Uh, in this case, oh, yeah. the, <laughs> the good deed did go unpunished. Uh, and I'm curious, when you're putting together... 20 songs or so with different artists does that get done through google docs or shared documents in that way so that so everyone can track progress basically it's just very very casual and uh well first of all your expression uh we have a similar one that i like <laughs> to say which is uh no rest for the wicked awesome <laughs> um, from our boston colloquialisms uh from our travels yeah, but, um, and, and and then also, but, uh, I, I think Little Stevie Van Zandt from the E Street Band, I think his label is Wicked Awesome Records. Oh, really? Uh, but I don't think he's doing it ironically like you guys are. <laughs> well, we're good We're good for irony. Uh, but uh, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, the way I did it was I really just, I reached out via email to each of these artists. Um, and some I had worked before and some I hadn't. Mm -hmm. And I, I just said like, hey, here's the deal. I'm not going to police you. I want you to do it however you want. But like, here's an example. Like I showed someone like the first one that I had done. I just said, you know, this is the pay. This is the, um, uh, you know, it can be black and white. It can be color. Right. I, I don't want to, I'm not the artist, you know? So I said, you can use all the lyrics. If you need the lyrics um, from me, I'll send them to you or you can look them up online. And then like, you know, it was mostly people who were fans of the band previously, but most of them are pretty excited to contribute and sort of do something that was different than what they usually do. That was the thing I heard the most from the artists was they were excited to, like Erica Williams is an amazing artist who does a lot of like really intricate um, 
illustrations and, and colored um, uh, pieces for like all kinds of merchandising and put the she prints she clays and all kinds of stuff. But she was like, this is so fun to do something different. Like, this is cool. She had a blast doing it. And, you know, that's like what you want to hear is that yeah. you came up with an outlet for somebody to do their work in a way that like just gives them like a different way of thinking about it. So anyway, we were, we were pleased about that. And um, we were happy that people had fun working on it. Is Murder by Death still based in Bloomington, Indiana? No, no, not for years. Um, we moved to Sarah and I, the cellist. We moved to Louisville, Kentucky, where she uh, lived for most of her childhood uh, about eight and a half years ago. And that's where we meet up to rehearse and everything. But the band members live in Sarah and I are in Louisville, Kentucky. Keyboard player in Atlanta, drummer in Portland, Oregon, bass player in Denver, and violinist in St. Louis, and crew live in Lawrence, Kansas, and L.A. Wow. So it's pretty wild. All the great college rock towns. Well, where I was going with Bloomington <laughs> is I <laughs> I recently attended an event of the Jim Ursay Band, uh, mm-hmm. the owner of the cults, where he basically had this all-star band full of all these people that you'd never think that somebody could afford to just hire for a night. So nice. it had Mike Mills from REM and Kenny Wayne nice. Shepard and Kenny Aronoff. And when someone oh, says yeah. Bloomington, I think Kenny Aronoff. Yeah, totally. I was curious if there was ever a moment when you had a run in with Kenny Aronoff, you know, because it is Mellencamp country. And yeah, being a so Long Island person. A drummer, uh, you know, is, is the one who knows the most about him. <laughs> and he's like, he, I feel like he at some point did, but I honestly don't remember the story. But uh, yeah, he's just like one of those dudes who's just like, you know, he's done a million different acts that he's played with and just like shit hot drummer. Um, yeah. I have never actually even had a Melon Camp interaction, though most of my friends who work either as like contractors or servers have some Melon Camp story. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he was sort of the like the crazy uncle who lived, uh, you know, outside of town and would show up every once in a while and, you know, just be a. Uh, He's a character, apparently. Uh, you know, I don't know. I've never met him. Yeah, out there, that's your melon camp. Here on Long Island, that's our Billy Joel, where people have. Oh, their... for sure. Yeah, I think those are they're cut from the same cloth. Like, you know, but you know, both both talented. You know, pop stars like they like I like I like songs about both those guys. So, and, and then something that I think about as I get older is that those were artists that were played on MTV when they were in their 30s and 40s. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's before MTV and VH1 kind of got a little ageist, where you can know you could be any age. You could be Suzanne Vega and have a hit, you know, in your 40s. I love that. I, you know, I got to say, like, as like I'm 41 now, mm-hmm. and I, like, I think about when you watch old movies, like, you watch, like, comedies or, um, you know... Uh, just like, yeah, like you're saying, like that kind of thing. Age didn't seem like it was uh, as uh, related to uh, stardom or, right. you know, popularity. And, and it's, it's interesting to me. I think it's getting a little better. Like you're seeing like women that are, um, you know, in their 40s cast in like good roles more than it was 10 years ago. There, I think there are improvements, you know, more diversity in casting for both, you know, for everything really. I think that's probably like, honestly, the most interesting thing that has happened in, uh, at least like movie media is, uh, having like writers and directors that are women or, or, you know, whatever, just people, diverse people, people of color, whatever. I think there's so much good content because of that. I I'm seeing stuff that I'm just like, Oh, that's interesting. That's a perspective that I, I had never seen in a show before or whatever. And it just, it, it, it's good for, if you, if you like media and you like entertainment, it ends up being really nice. <laughs> but yeah, I think it's interesting. Like, I don't feel like I'm uh, dried up <laughs> at 41. You <laughs> right, know, right. like I, like, I think this is one of the best records I've ever been a part of. And I'm really excited. And, you know, uh, the feedback is, has uh, grown the same thing from everybody. I've gotten more, 
positive feedback by far than any album we've ever put out. So it's like, I don't believe that you just automatically like turn off and get bad at writing a certain age, you know? Probably not uh, without throwing a, ba- a bunch of bands under the bus here, but that actually ties in with something I'm super curious about. And you mentioned at the beginning, 22 years of the band, you formed, I can do math pretty well in 2000 uh-huh. and the band survived some different label configurations. And as you mentioned, it, it's been around so long that vinyl went from a niche thing to maybe a thing that outsells CDs. I'm sure, curious, oh, for sure. At what point you realized that you were a cottage industry, that it was not about having yeah. hits, that, you know, uh, every two, three years we do an album, we do the 100 to yeah. 250 dates in support that's of that. That's a good way to put it, a cottage industry. That's really, I had never really thought of it quite like that, but that's exactly what that term, yeah, we are totally that. <laughs> and, uh, um, yeah, I mean, basically everything we have done has been out of necessity. I think we get a lot of credit from people who like us, Uh, as if we're these like innovators and, you know, we'll we'll have a lot of articles that um, the ones that do get written about this stuff that, that, you know, praise us kind of for being like very DIY and hands-on and the fans love it. And they say a lot of stuff like that. But the truth is we just, we didn't get a lot of look. You know, we we had a moment in maybe like 2000, Five, where it seemed like something was going to happen for our band. The Gerard we Way, Jeff that, Rickley kind of era of, oh, th- those guys like this band, therefore you should too. Sure. So, yeah, yeah, there was a moment where like people were like, well, yeah, exactly. Like We had had some stamps of approval. There was like some hype building in the, in the bigger machine. Of course, we were so young, we had no clue how to harness it or do anything. And in fact, we wanted nothing to do with the... Um, the mainstream world because we weren't a band that we did not see potential for ourselves in that world. You know, like you're saying like Gerard Ways, like those guys had huge ambition and they knew what they wanted and how to harness it. And they thought they could actually translate. Right. We never thought that. And we never, we were like, we were from such an indie scene. Like we were into like quarter stick records and touch and go. And like, we were like, we were not, like the biggest bands that we liked played for like a hundred people most nights, you know, it's a, uh, all our favorite stuff was tiny. So we didn't see like this, like a uh, potential for, um, big explosion of our career. And that was fine. And so like, you know, when the major label kind of thing was swarming around some of the people that we knew and sort of like sniffing us out, we didn't really believe that anything was going to happen. So, but there was there were people telling us like oh you're gonna you're gonna do great. But the the interesting thing is that they were telling us um, people we worked with in the industry were saying stuff like you guys are never gonna blow up, but you're gonna get big enough, and people will love you and they'll stay with you. They're not just gonna bail on you. Right. And they were right about that. And I you know I credit them for giving us the confidence to believe that that was true. Um, that kind of thing. And so uh, what ended up happening though is like we had a merch fulfillment company and we just felt like we need, we couldn't afford to give them 20% anymore because we were broke all the time and we're working constantly on the road, on the road, like 250 days a year. Mm -hmm. And so we just started doing our own mail order as it came in. Um, When we were home, we would do like big promotions. And then like, it was the same thing with the vinyl. We couldn't get anyone to put out the vinyl because they just didn't want to spend the money. But I was like, well, I'll try it. And then, so everything happened that way and we really leaned into it. And I would say the year that changed everything for us was like 2013 Hmm. when we, that was the first year we did our Stanley hotel shows, um, which was, you know, us promoting our own shows with a concept that nobody had ever done. And we also had done, uh, maybe 2012 is the year we booked it maybe, but then, uh, 2012, we also, uh, did our first Kickstarter. Yeah. So it really had become like totally hands on from the concerts to the, you know, merchandise to the album pre sale. And we did it because, you know, there are bands that just have labels and press knocking down their door constantly. Yeah. We've just been around a long time. And I think a lot of um, people in the industry just feel like that we've already done our thing. But when you're an artist and you want to keep making art, 
you don't feel that way. And so like, you just have to either say like, okay, well, I'm going to bet on myself uh, or I'm going to just go away. And, you know, it's like, <laughs> you know, and like that's, yeah. that's your choices. Or, you know, some people, I, I guess the majority of people really just kind of float around and they um, do their best to hang on and hope that somebody with enough influence will sort of like guide their career. But, you know, I just, we, we knew that there was an audience that really cared about us even early on. And we were grateful for that. And we just tried to, um, use, uh, what we had and work with what we got. And, you know, it's made a, a good life for all of us. You know, we're not, yeah. uh, we're not the biggest band in the world, but, we have really supportive people that are excited about us and keep us going and allow us to keep to be creative uh, for a living. And I mean, it is, it has exceeded all my hopes and expectations. Uh, I'm, you know, I, that's the yeah. honest truth there is like, I did not see this. You never could have told me when I was, you know, writing the songs for who will survive in like 2001, 2002, that I'd be 41 years old and about to hit the road for you know a tour that's like bigger than any previous tour you know i never would have thought that it's it's crazy it's that cottage industry that's going really well and do you have time for one more question that will be indiana related okay so as somebody that's very slowly writing a book about david lee roth in researching (laughs) him he's originally from indiana and his family is originally from indiana i was curious you said before uh, that most of the bands that you and that you and your bandmates loved were playing to a hundred people a night. But was Van Halen one of the bands that in any way shaped you musically? Me, not at all. No, actually, I'm not even into Van Halen. Uh, it's for whatever reason, I never identified with that group. Um, <laughs> I think our drummer Dagan would answer that differently um, for sure. Uh, but I think he, I think he grew up loving them. But I grew up in Detroit. And then I moved to Bloomington in 99 for college. And oh, um, the- Van Halen was like a surface kind of group. And I lived in Bloomington for 15 years um, and I loved it. But um, that was not a band that, and Mellon Camp was not someone I was really that aware of before I moved there either. I grew up listening to like a lot of, my stepmom was a lot younger than my dad. And so she would take me as her little concert buddy and I would go see just like my, like my little pedigree by the time I was like 14 was insane. Like I had seen uh, Iggy pop, David <laughs> Bowie, Lou Reed, uh, nine inch nails, like red hot chili peppers, Smashing pumpkins, like all these great acts. Uh, the cure was one of my favorite band and still probably my favorite band. I'd seen them a couple times before I was in high school. Um, King Crimson, like just, it was my, what I was listening to as like a kid was um, definitely like pretty like arty and out there. <laughs> and I just kind of missed, I mean, Van Halen is arty in their own way. I mean, like his guitar playing is insane. Yes. But, um, uh, but it's like, I did not, I never got on that like sort of like eighties rock thing until I got, I got into really into Iron Maiden in college and I was just like, how did I miss this? You know? <laughs> like, but I was like, when I was, uh, when I was the age that I think I would have been discovering, um, uh, Van Halen, I was into like pavement and like Elliot Smith. <laughs> so wow. I was on a different trajectory. So you had taste from a young age. That's what I'm or learning. Or morphine. Like I was like listening <laughs> nice. to morphine at like 13. So <laughs> I like, I, uh, it, it was just, it was, it wasn't that I had taste. It was just that the music that was sort of like shown to me was good. She had good taste. And so therefore like I picked up the stuff that I liked. Yeah. But, uh, I was in, formed early with somebody who had cool taste in music and um you know for me like i think it changed my life because uh i would not have discovered the majority of that stuff on my own i, I know that for a fact and um i was able to uh i think like show up i think that's the reason that like we could have such a weird diverse band at such a young age you know we were 18 when we started the band and um 
you know, I had a pretty good musical education and a lot of my bandmates did too. They had diverse tastes. And, um, I mean, we had like really eclectic mix of interests and we were just making music. We started with the right premise. We started making music for fun. <laughs> yeah. Not to be like, I'm going to be a this style band so I can fit into this group or click musically. And you know, we just made music that seemed interesting to us and we never stopped. And amazingly, you survived your childhood without being a Vanilla Ice fan. So good on you for that. Oh, uh, no, I did not survive that. I had to accept. <laughs> <laughs> to the extreme. Well, the bottom I, line I got, is... I think I got it for my like fifth grade birthday. Somebody got it for me. And I was like, oh, he's so cool. I definitely <laughs> I did have that too. Wow. <laughs> well, Adam, you, you, you know, I'm so glad to see that the band keeps getting bigger and better. Spellbound is, is an example of that. And looking forward to your next gig in New York City. But keep up all the greatness there. And best of luck with yeah, the well, album cycle. Thank you so much. Yeah, we'll be there in a couple of weeks. Outrocast.